The Pima Indians came out of the, the Bering Strait, migrated down, some moved to Arizona, some moved to Mexico. And the ones in Arizona, right, they were pretty healthy for a while, right? Um, they gardened, they hunted, they farmed, all these, they, they, they had their own healthy food. And when Westerners started coming into the area around the gold rush time, they started eating more Western food, right? And there were some food substance programs. So they got flour, they got bacon and lard, and started eating white bread, all those things. They started getting obese. And yet the Caucasians around them who were eating the same foods that weren't obese, right? So they, could, they could handle this. So there's, a, there's very much a genetic component to everything. I think the conclusion with the Pima Indians is that they had you know, a history of, of uh, famine, right, in, in their um, ancestry. And so they had evolved a thrifty genotype that, that really told their bodies to save whenever you can save food. If there's an extra molecule anywhere, save it into your fat. And so they, they could get very fat. And I suspect this is similar with Indians as well. Right. There's there was plenty of famine in India. Right. And so we, we probably also evolved a thrifty genotype. But if you have that kind of thrifty genotype, um, you know, if you're from Mexico or you're from, you know, Asian countries and you come here and food is an abundance and there's a lot of Caucasians eating this, you know, plentifully and not having a problem, you start trying to do the same. Your body might not react the same. You have a different genotype one that comes from you know ancestry of famine people who've been through hardship it's looking to re to reserve every single calorie Today's show, we catch up with the author of this great book called The Secret Life of Fat. Her name is Sylvia Terra. She has a PhD. She's a great researcher, great writer. This book has been on my bookshelf for a number of years, and I think it should be on yours as well. Today, we talk all about fasting, fat loss, some new updates when it comes to personalizing different fasting and exercise protocols based upon uh, leptin and ghrelin levels, some new research you may be familiar with or you may not be, which I will also link in the show notes because it's really important that we understand that we can personalize our way in to health. There's not a one size fits all that works for everyone. And part of why we have these podcasts is to help you individualize and personalize your approach to optimizing health. So check out the show notes and the links below to books. And I do want to let you know that this show is brought to you by our very own Myoscience Nutrition. So today as we talk about fasting, as we talk about individualizing weight loss and various protocols, I want you to consider a natural compound that has been shown to be really effective amongst my clients and in the academic research. It's called berberine, berberine hydrochloride. So this is a natural product that actually has a, a large dossier of peer-reviewed academic research uh, supporting its health-promoting properties in the realm of blood sugar health support. But I like to advise clients to use this to kickstart their fast. Consider this like a fasting accelerant. And I figured this out when I was wearing a continuous glucose monitor a number of years, when I would take one or two capsules of berberine hydrochloride it jacked up my ketones. And I thought that's really interesting in a favorable manner. Of course, by jacked up, I mean increase. And I started to recommend this to clients and they started to notice that it affected their appetite and, and reduced uh, feelings of cravings when they were starting to fast. So if you're struggling with appetite issues, craving issues when you're starting your fast, you can try one or two capsules of our berberine plus ALA. So ALA is alpha lipoic acid and we also have biotin in there. This trifecta of berberine hydrochloride with ALA and biotin is a really nice synergistic blend that's not very commonly found together. So you too can support your body's ketone and fatty acid metabolism and help to kickstart your fast by going over to myoscience.com. That's myoscience with an X, M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com and check out the berberine ALA formula and you can use the coupon code podcast to save. Again, that's myoscience.com. So hopefully you enjoy this podcast and let's cut back to it with Sylvia Tara. Sylvia, thank you so much for being here. You know, I bought your book, uh, Secret Life of Fat in an Airport. I was, I like to travel and go to independent bookstores when I am traveling, you know, for doing these interviews, which I used to do more in person, but uh, got your book in a bookstore and uh, it, you do such a great job of exploring some of the scientific understandings that I think um, researchers know about, but the average person doesn't know about, about uh, adipocytes or fat cells in their biology and uh, infect obesity and how different microbes like adenovirus affects our fat cell phenotype and everything like there's so much here. So uh, first of all, I want to commend you for writing and doing a, such a great job of translating some of that research into an, more of a intelligible way for laymen to understand. So thank you for that. And maybe let's first, you know, one of the big questions um, that, that comes up because when we talk about fat and obesity uh, and everything, people, there's 
kind of two schools of camps, right? And I think you fall more into the fasting, intermittent fasting kind of camp, which I do too. So it's easy to get biased about that. But then there's a lot of people that are big into calorie counting. And and the reason why our fat cells enlarge and, and, and start to get engorged with fat is because we're eating too much energy. What do you say to that after interviewing so many different people? That there's truth to both of those things. I mean, calories do count and where your calories come from also count. So even if you're intermittent fasting, if I were to have 5,000 calories in the time that I ate, right, I wouldn't probably start gaining weight, right? So, so, So I do think the amount of calories still matters and where you're getting them from, right? So, you know, is it nutritious? Is it empty calories? Is it processed food? Uh, I do find intermittent fasting to be a a really good solution for very stubborn fat. It's not necessarily easy for everyone to do. And so what I tell people when they're picking a diet, being low calorie, be it, you know, probably protein or be it, you know, um, fasting, your diet has to work for you, right? It's really important. Some of my research shows there are effects to losing weight. It has biological effects on our body because we lose some of the fats, uh, the hormones that fat produces. And some of the effects will last for years. And we can get into this in more detail, but generally people will be more hungry, right? After they lose weight. And that's because you have a reduction in leptin. Your metabolism is slower now after you've lost weight. And so you're, you need fewer calories now going forward and you need a little bit more exercise. So whatever diet you decide to stay on, it has to work for you psychologically, sociologically, and it has to work for you biologically too. So psychologically, something that you can stand, right? I know there's, there's some diets out there that require a lot of prep, right? A lot of certain foods, a lot of ways to prepare them. It's hard for me to stay on them and I don't stay on them long. So psychologically it doesn't work for me. There's other foods out there, you know, or, or, or diets out there that if you, if you travel and you have meals, you have social dining quite a bit, some of those diets are also going to be hard to stay on. For those, those people, I think really a low carb diet is best because you can eat. Um, so it has to work for you, for your, for your lifestyle. And then it has to be working for you biologically. You're actively, actually losing weight. I've been on some diets where I have gained weight. And so I think you can, you can be in any of the diets that we might talk about here, but it's got to work for you for the long run. And for you personally, which diet was that that caused you to gain weight? Oh gosh. I think there was a, the biggest loser kind of philosophy where you have to eat enough calories to lose weight. Do you remember that was a, a fad still is for some people where you, you spend all day exercising and then you have to keep eating calories because that was thought to cre- keep your metabolism going because you had that thermic energy, you know, metabolism going on. I gained weight. I cannot eat all the time. My body can't. And that was part of the reason I, I did this research is because there was a lot of diets out there. And I would notice I, I didn't lose as much weight as people around me. Sometimes I would gain weight and it kept me searching for a diet. And I think a lot of people are on this camp. They're always looking for, for what can I stay on? I failed at that one. That one didn't work. And, you know, I'm a scientist by training. So I thought if, you know, I'm just going to understand fat once and for all, I'm, I'm going to understand my body. And I went through five years of researching fat. I pulled out a thousand publications and read them all out of the scientific literature. I talked to about 50 scientists around the world. And it turns out fat is not just fat. And that's number one. You have to stop thinking about it as just a repository of calories or blubber that we have to get rid of. That is not the case. Fat is actually a complex endocrine organ and you have to treat it like that. So it's like your thyroid gland. It's like your adrenal gland, right? Pituitary gland. It's part of that complex endocrine system. And fat produces a couple hormones that are critical that your body depends on. Leptin is one of them. And so when you start losing fat, you start getting lower levels of leptin because you're now losing fat. And that difference in the leptin level is something your body reacts to enormously. Leptin is released from fat into the bloodstream and it binds with your hypothalamus and it binds with your skeletal muscle. When it binds with your hypothalamus, right? It tells tells your brain everything's okay in the world. There's fat, there's leptin, we're doing okay. When you have reduced levels of it, your brain goes into overdrive and tries to find food. So your appetite goes through the roof. And there are studies where they, they show people who've lost about 10% of their body weight and they, their, their brains light up wildly when they see pictures of food. And interestingly, those parts of the brain involved with inhibition are, are more are dim, right? They're, they're less active. And so they're driven to eat with less ability to control themselves, hmm. right? And this effect will last for a long time. And your skeletal muscle, when it starts to notice less leptin in circulation, starts to get much more efficient. You burn about 25% fewer calories when you exercise, right? And about 20% fewer calories in your resting metabolism when you have, when you start to lose your fat and you get start to get to lower leptin. And that effect can last for years. 
it can last for about, it's been studied up to six years and they're not really sure how long it lasts. And that, that's why I say going forward, right? Someone who was 170 and lost 20 pounds to get to 150 versus someone who was at 150 pounds to begin with, the person who lost those 20 pounds now has to eat 22% fewer calories than the person who was naturally at 150 pounds. And this can last forever. <laughs> so find a diet you like, right? That you can stay on forever. That isn't, they're not temporary. It's not like you go on this for three months and then you go back to your life. Like this is kind of, it's going to be you going forward. Uh, there's so much, there's so much to unpack there. I, I love that you broke that down. And there's a few things that, that I want to just kind of unpack. And, and the first one being this idea that there's different subtypes of being overweight, for example. And you mentioned, you know, the the changes in leptin. And I think other studies looked at ghrelin. And correct me if I'm wrong, I, there's been a few of these different studies, but they, they, they basically found like the, the delta or the change in your ghrelin leptin will actually determine how long you will stay, how long you'll prevent weight regain. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of different, you know, biomarkers for it. So I think, you know, we, we all think we see other people getting success. We're not getting success. And we just think, well, it's just calories. That's all it is. But there's probably different types of being overweight, just like there's different subtypes of type two diabetes. We all think it's, well, of course it's garden variety insulin resistance, but if, if you're exposed to environmental toxins, you could be insulin resistant by that mechanism. So do you think there are sort of different types of obesity or excessive fatness, so to speak? I think there's fat blueprints, right? Everyone's metabolism is slightly different. So, you know, we talked about leptin and fat as an organ. Um, there's other things that, that come into this. Genetics comes into this quite a bit. And people don't like to think that. They like to think I'm in control. Genetics has nothing to do with it. It can. And it doesn't mean you have to be heavy. It just means you might have to work harder than other people do. Right? Our microbiome comes into it. Right? You mentioned viruses too. That, that can have an effect on fat, believe it or not. I, I just spoke to someone who said that he had Lyme disease and had started having trouble managing fat afterward. Um, hormones. Hormones and age is a really big deal, right? Our hormones, some of our fat busting hormones like testosterone, estrogen, growth hormone, they decline with age. And so we start to pack on weight. We get less muscle mass, less bone mass and more fat mass unless we do something about it. And then gender, I have a whole chapter on women versus men. And uh, you know, I think any woman who's noticed that they <laughs> have to work a lot harder than men, right? This is, this is the chapter for you. Um, women partition nutrients differently, right? So all these things go into your own being. So the person who's a 22 year old male, right? Who has 15 pounds to lose and has, has, you know, has only had it for a few months is gonna have a very different trajectory on weight loss compared to a 55 year old female who's had 50 pounds on her, that's extra for say five years. And that has two kids and has all these other things. And, and you, the hormones for that person, for these two people are very different. Um, fat gets vascularized as the more it stays on you, it gets more blood supply, which means it's easier to maintain and, 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 uh, and stay on you. And then also just the gender part is gonna make a big difference for her too. And the yo-yo dieting that you know, could have gone on, right? I talked about leptin, you know, when we lose weight, it's harder to lose weight later, right? And so all those things will factor in and you have to know what is, what is you, what is your life? What is likely to be the issues with your fat? And then you might have to ratchet up the diet more, right? More than other people on the same diet. You might have to stay on it longer or do it much more um, in a more restricted way than other people do. Which is kind of scary to think about. So, so there's a lot of people, like you said, that have tried various different diets. They've lost 10 pounds and regained it back. And then they've lost another 15 and so forth. And something that you mentioned, this the busy, biggest loser, and there was a biggest loser follow-up study, is this so-called adaptive thermogenesis, where their body's metabolism set point is lower now. And basically, their, their metabolism is more sluggish, even though they've lost weight. So to maintain that weight loss, they have to eat even less calories and exercise more, which, so it seems like at what point, you know, it's like more restrictive and all that. So you can kind of see where if you only focus on calories in, calories out, then basically come, it, it might come down to like, you're eating what, 700 calories a day. And that's basically, I mean, you, so then you get more hungry, then you're cold and then your hormones are out of whack. So it seems like, again, I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, don't try calorie restriction. I'm not saying overdo the calories, but it seems like if you could, approach it from the idea of intermittent fasting, cyclical ketogenic diets, exercise. It seems that some of the studies that I've read, those don't have the same suppressive effect on our metabolism. What would you say to that? Again, it depends on what works for you, right? I'm going to get back to the, the socially, psychologically, biologically. 
I really like intermittent fasting, right? It's what I ended up working for me to bust through extremely stubborn fat. I have a lot of things working against me. I have genetics working against me. I have age, right? I have yo-yo dieting in my past and I'm female. I've got everything working against me, right? Um, the way I learned that this is what worked is I kept a log of everything I ate and I would weigh myself every day. So like the log had what I ate, the caloric content, um, it had the time I ate it, if I took aspirin that day, anything I did, I kept a log of what was going into me. Um, and that's when I started to notice that if I didn't eat after say three or four o'clock, I actually would lose weight. Otherwise that scale would stay exactly where it was. Mm -hmm. right? And there were some things I could eat that you're not supposed to be able to eat, but I didn't, I didn't gain weight. And there are other things where they're not considered not bad, I did. So, you know, it's very individual. And there's research that shows that too, right? Some research done in Israel actually, where they have people eat different foods and they measure their blood glucose. And there are some people who can have sugar, like they can have a muffin or cookie and their blood glucose doesn't spike. Other people, they have a bite, it spikes. So even how you respond to food is very individual. So as you keep a log, you start to learn what is working for you. And you're less susceptible to siren songs and diets all over because you're starting to see your own body now. But intermittent fasting, I think, is good. One is that, you know, our growth hormone peaks at night, right? So if you need extra help, like it's not just cutting calories anymore. You're not that 22-year-old male. You've got really stubborn fat now. You're older, you know, gender issues, uh, hormone issues. You want to, you need to start looking at your own endocrine system and how you can take advantage of it and make it work for you now. Our growth hormone peaks at night. When we eat though, it mitigates the effects of growth hormone. Growth hormone is a fantastic fat buster, right? So if you eat around the time of that growth hormone peak, it has less of an effect as if you don't eat. It has more of an effect if you're on, if you're on empty. So when you do intermittent fasting, especially overnight, you're prolonging the effect of growth hormone and that fat busting effect. You get more glucagon in your pancreas, right? That also has great fat busting effect. You have more leptin. So sleep is also correlated with leptin. So when you get a good amount of sleep, leptin levels are higher, you feel a little bit more satiated overall. Willpower is increased with intermittent fasting. People are able to control themselves more because they have these kind of cutoffs of when they eat. And I noticed that uh, when I did that, fat melted pretty well. And what also is good is you have more food latitude. I talk about food latitude in my new course that I have now available. When you do intermittent fasting, you have to be less careful, I find, about what you eat and the time you eat, right? So I, I can actually have a little, a couple bites of, you know, gummy bears or whatever if I'm from really craving something. And I don't really get a penalty as long as I do that fast. So again, for me, I'm not someone who's like terribly obedient on diets. I don't like a hundred rules, right? I like it to be straightforward. I like, I want to eat what I want to eat sometimes. Intermittent fasting allows me to do that and still lose weight, maintain a low weight. And, you know, for stubborn fat, it was able to bust through, you know, a lot of those pounds for me. And so I like it. I, I think you can do low calorie. I find when people are, are doing what you mentioned, low calorie all the time, they're always looking for food, right? They're, they're never really satisfied. At least with intermittent fasting, you're satisfied for some hours of the day, right? I think at nighttime when I'm fasting, I get a little bit, you know, I want something to eat and I just control myself. But low cal all day, you just never have that moment of satisfaction. So psychologically, I think people fail on it after a while. It's a really great point. There was some, a, a bunch of, I like to read like about psychology and mindset and things like that. And when you have flexibility to so-called break the rules, um, people tend to adhere to, to things longer. And so you mentioned like you're breaking the rules by having gummy bears, but you've been in a calorie deficit all day. So it kind of doesn't matter. Of course, if you were splitting hairs and trying to, you know, be in a bodybuilding competition, that might be a little bit different, but, you know, by and large, you're able to, to get the results you want by having a little bit of that flexibility. And I think that's where the restrictiveness of like, you know, you're bookending your day by this many calories and you can't go over or under it and all that. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it's really interesting, but a few different studies, you know, we've kind of talked about on the podcast before there was researchers at university of Colorado and they had a continuous energy restriction group, which is like low calorie group versus an intermittent fasting group. And over the long haul, there were, there wasn't that, uh, so-called adaptive thermogenesis and suppression in metabolic rate. There was another study that just came out, um, gosh, where I, I want to say it was out of Turkey or maybe somewhere in there. And they had three different groups of fasting mimicking diet that an intermittent fasting group and then a continuous energy restriction group. They found similar things and similar weight loss, but the so-called suppression of metabolic rate or adaptive thermogenesis was, was more pronounced, especially even after the dieting intervention in the group that did the continuous energy restriction. So 
whatever works for you, figure it out. But um, I'm with you in the intermittent fasting thing. You know, periodically what I'll do on a Monday is just fast on a Monday where I don't eat anything. And then that, then I, I don't feel like if I have or on the weekend, if we have some wine or if we go out to brunch or whatever, it's like, I don't, it's so much easier to um, sort of, it's like a good gut reset, which we can get into, but uh, to, to just restrict calories, it's a great way to, to do that. But it's, it's transient and it's, it's not like this predictable every single day. So you don't create that adaptation, which I think is interesting. Um, getting back into the, the fat cells themselves, you mentioned that uh, as you get more overweight, they become vascularized. And you, you talk about in the book how they become more inflamed. And one of the futures that is common with uh, risk factors with severe outcomes with the coronavirus is more chronic inflammation. So what is it about our fat cells that we, if we get, especially around the abdomen, the visceral region, as they get enlarged and all that, um, why, what happens with the immune system and how, how does that affect our uh, immune defenses? Yeah, that's a whole interesting thing. So visceral fat is what we're talking about, that that belly fat that's underneath the stomach wall. So there's different types of fat. One is a subcutaneous fat, right? That white fat underneath your skin and your arms and your legs. That's mostly the kind of fat you want to lose when you go on a diet, right? There is visceral fat, that fat underneath the stomach wall. That's the dangerous fat that leads to problems with the immune system, diabetes, heart disease. You know, there's also brown fat that actually burns calories, right? That you get on cold exposure and beige fat that can turn into brown. But, but visceral fat, it gets really crowded, right? You're underneath the stomach wall. So there's not that kind of flexibility you get under skin where you can just keep expanding skin. So it's really tight in there. It starts to get kind of inflamed. When it gets really tight, it starts to get hypoxic, meaning there's a lot of, not a lot of oxygen for those fat cells. They start to send out cytokine signals saying there's something wrong. We're suffering. We're, we're, we're suffocating here. Something's, there's a problem. Your body reacts to that like it reacts to a cut. There's a problem. Let's send every single immune cell there. Let's send in macrophages. Let's send in, you know, white blood cells. All kinds of things will go into there. And it becomes a storm of different immune factors in there. It starts to interfere with insulin signaling, right? All, all that inflammation. And then you start to you know, have more problems because your, your, your nutrients aren't being stored into fat, they're floating around, it's, it's correlating with heart disease, right? It, it starts to produce diabetes too. So it's really the visceral fat that is a problem. And there's actually ways to, to move your fat to the right areas, if you will. So, and fat helps with this. This is another astounding thing about fat. There's another hormone it produces. So we talked about leptin, right? This effect on your appetite and your, and your metabolism. Fat also produces adiponectin. It releases it into the blood. And basically what adiponectin does is it guides your fat in your blood to the right places in the body into subcutaneous fat deposits, right? And actually, as you start to you know, burn fat and it gets released into your system, it will also move that fat, whatever's left, right? Into the right deposits of your body. So I write about sumo wrestlers because it's really fascinating research. Um, sumo wrestlers, obviously they're obese, right? And that's actually all subcutaneous fat. When you do CT images on them, they don't have visceral fat. That's just underneath their skin. And the reason they can do this, um, that what they don't have the uh, visceral fat is because they exercise for about six to seven hours a day. And when they exercise, they get higher levels of adiponectin. So all the 6,000 calories a day they eat, it goes into the more healthy deposits of fat on their body. And they don't get heart disease or diabetes, right? They're metabolically healthy, even though they're so heavy. And it's because of levels of adiponectin. And interestingly, when they come off their sumo wrestler um, program and they don't exercise as much, they get metabolically unhealthy very quickly, right? So it's their exercise that's actually protecting them. So yeah, there's, there's inflammation in visceral fat. It leads to all kinds of problems. And if you exercise though, and it's not light exercise, really, if you, if you really want to move your fat, it's around two hours of exercise a day, right? It's quite a bit of jogging and, and running and aerobic exercise, but you can, right? You can, you can get your fat into the right areas. It's amazing. It's almost like fat's trying to keep us healthy. It's trying to say like fat, come home, come home to the right place. Right. This person healthy. And that signaling. Yeah. That, that's such a great point. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize uh, or test for uh, adiponectin. It's kind of leptin is the big buzzword because everyone has heard about hyperleptinemia and leptin resistance, but adipo adiponectin, um, there's some really good research too on insulin sensitivity and all of this, which is pretty fascinating. But um, one thing that I love for people to understand because I, I don't think it's talked about enough, we tend to vilify uh, and kind of like you're overweight, something's wrong with you and all that. But about, I think it's 20 to 25% of visibly skinny or lean people 
are fat on the inside and have this visceral adiposity that you're referring to. So um, I think it's important to kind of just talk about that and how a lot of people don't realize like, oh, I had a friend who was really thin and they got super sick and we're, everyone's questioning why. We're like, just because you're thin, it doesn't mean you don't have this intra abdominal fat and it's not, you know, depositing into your pancreas and your heart and your liver and all that. Do you want to talk about Tofi? Yeah. So skinny fat, right? Um, definitely. And it's some, it's also somewhat genetic and somewhat racial, right? So like Eastern Indians have this a lot um, and I'm Eastern Indian, so I, I know, <laughs> but they can look very thin, right? But they actually have high levels of fat and high levels of visceral fat, oddly. And so they, they have more heart disease. And I think it's in parts of Malaysia and parts of, of uh, you know, the Asian world a little bit more, but it, it's again, somewhat genetic where we deposit our fat um, where it goes. And it's just dependent on how much you know, exercise we do because that is leading to adiponectin. So it's definitely possible to be thin on the outside, but where your fat's depositing can be somewhat misleading. And so I always say, you know, there, there's a kind of rule that if you lie on your back, this is a cheap, easy way to figure out if you have visceral fat. You know, if you have a paunch on your stomach and it stays there when you, when you lie flat on your back, that is probably visceral fat. If it kind of flattens when you lie on your stomach, then it's probably subcutaneous fat. And in general, it's best not to have too much fat, but if you're gonna have some extra fat, then put it in the right place, right? Just make sure it's staying out of your visceral area. And I think intermittent fasting also busts through visceral fat a bit, right? There's some correlation with that as well. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Yeah, I think, and this is where things like DEXAs or MRIs come in where people can more quantify uh, where their fat is. And I think that's interesting. Actually, my wife and I got a full body MRI about a year and a half ago. And uh, the gentleman who owns this company, Prenovo, his name is Raj, he's Eastern Indian as well. And he, he spoke about where he carries his fat is around, around the viscera region. And I didn't get a chance to ask him. So I'll ask you, Sylvia, why is this a, a byproduct of Western culture and stuff like that, where people come from India over here, they start eating the processed foods, or is this predominant? Would you see this if we were to biopsy randomly 300 people in India versus, you know, it, it, you know is it culturally and it, is it a, you know, the, a side effect of consuming foods that probably shouldn't be consumed by humans at all, but especially folks from India? Definitely. And I write about the Pima Indians in the book, right? That's a, a population that's been studied. So, you know, the Pima Indians came out of the, the Bering Strait, migrated down, some moved to Arizona, some moved to Mexico. And the ones in Arizona, right, they were pretty healthy for a while, right? Um, they gardened, they hunted, they farmed all these, like they, they had their own healthy food. And when Westerners started coming into the area around the gold rush time, they started eating more Western food, right? And there were some food substance programs. So they got flour, they got bacon and lard and started eating white bread, all those things. They started getting obese. And yet the Caucasians around them who were eating the same foods that weren't obese, right? So they, could, they could handle this. So there's, a, there's very much a genetic component to everything. I think the conclusion with the Pima Indians is that they had you know, history of, of uh, famine, right, in, in their um, ancestry. And so they had evolved a thrifty genotype that, that really told their bodies to save whenever you can save food. If there's an extra molecule anywhere, save it into your fat. And so they, they could get very fat. And I suspect this is similar with Indians as well, right? There's, there was plenty of famine in India, right? And so we, we probably also evolved a thrifty genotype. But if you have that kind of thrifty genotype, um, you know, if you're from Mexico or you're from, you know, Asian countries and you come here and food is in abundance and there's a lot of Caucasians eating this, you know, plentifully and not having a problem, you start trying to do the same, your body might not react the same. You have a different genotype, one that comes from, you know, ancestry of famine, people who've been through hardship. It's looking to, re to reserve every single calorie. So you just have to be careful. And I actually think that this is one thing leading to the obesity epidemic in America is that we've, we're so multiracial now, right? People are from all over the place. Food is more plentiful than ever before. The other part of the epidemic, I think, has to do with just how processed food is. Do people even know what's in their food? There's a lot of filler. You might feel like you're eating a chicken breast, but actually it's half gelatin, it's half filler, it's got carbs in it. You have to really know what you're eating and start cooking again, right? Don't just rely on what is sold to you as a healthy option. And it's really like maybe 20% real food. It's such a scary thing to think about. And the trend now, people are just ordering food off the internet. They're not even handpicking it themselves. Pre-made meals, takeout meals, all of that. Um, it's going to be interesting to see. And then now with schools, you know, canceling sports, 
a lot of a lot of kids. I noticed with my daughter because I work from home, um, she's taking more trips to the fridge, you know. Whereas in school, like she wouldn't be able to do that. So just the constant snacking and all that, and of course, you know, we're we're aware enough to have healthy items for her fruit and things for snacks. But still, um, yeah, you bring up a really good point. And, and so um, to kind of put a, a bow on the on the sort of thrifty genotype idea, this is where fasting I think is great because you're you're sort of mimicking that in a in an environment where food is plentiful. So that's another uh, future that I think is kind of unique. Um, so we're hearing a lot about microbes and viruses, obviously in the media because of coronavirus, but, uh, there's this adenovirus story. You talk about a farmer who was like, he gained a bunch of weight. It's an amazing story. So we have backyard chickens and just yesterday, it's funny, Sylvia, um, it's interesting that we're having this conversation just yesterday. So we have a rooster and roosters have these little spite. I don't even, whatever. They're these like almost hook like futures on their legs. And he was, she was trying to show me, Hey, his name is, uh, we call him lavender cause he's a lavender Americana and he totally scraped her arm and she started bleeding. And I was like, Oh my gosh, it reminded me of the story that you talked about in your book. And so I immediately like we rinsed it off with hydrogen peroxide and put Neosporin on it and whatever. But anyway, um, what, tell us the story uh, about the farmer who, who a rooster kicked him and then what happened to his body weight. This is so interesting. You know, it's funny because in that story, it's this, the story of the scientist and the patient was so interesting for, and both their lives intersect to just have this enormous finding. So, I mean, viruses it, making animals fat has been known about for a long time. There's been canine distemper virus, you know, Ross sarcoma virus um, in chickens, and it, they've been known to correlate with fatness in animals. Right? But sometimes they've actually crossed over into humans. And so there is one called AD36, and it, it does make you know, monkeys fatter. Right, that, That's one thing that was known. And I think the, the scientist who's Nikhil Durander actually came from India, and he noticed that there was a virus there called SMAN1 that was correlated to fatness in chickens, which he thought was very weird. And he started doing this research, and he finally came to the US, and he was looking for a similar virus. And they found one called AD36. And so he had a research program going on um, in the Midwest. And the man, Randy, that I write about, uh, he was the farmer and uh, he had been fighting with fat for his whole life. And he didn't understand why it was so hard for him. People around him would eat a lot. He'd have to be very careful about his calories. He was six foot one and he had to eat what you know, seemed like a, a 12 year old girl kind of limit of calories. And he, he couldn't figure this out. And he had finally gotten the heavy, he got tired of it, he gained weight. And in this hospital, they sent him over to this research program. Um, you know, and Nikhil, it was Nikhil Durando's research program and they did a test and they found that he actually had, was positive for having AD36, this virus that is known to cause fat uh, in humans and animals. And, and once he discovered that, he actually was really relieved. So a lot of people think, oh, it's over, I, I, I'll never be okay again. But it had the opposite effect for him because now that he knew what the problem was, right, um, he could actually do something about it. So now he knew that he has to eat a little bit less, right? And then he traced it back to how did I ever get this? And he realized he got scratched by a chicken, right, when he was like, you know, a young teenager, right, just about to start his teen years. And he, he realized like that's when he thought he started having the problem was right around there. Mm. So like the scientists don't know if that was actually he got infected at that moment or not, but that's when Randy at least started saying he started to have more problems with weight. And knowing that 8036 is an animal, you know, and it can make its way to human, you know, it's feasible that that, that might have been what happened. So, so viruses are, are correlated to fat, um, which is interesting. And, and basically what they do is they, they help the cells. It's an adenovirus, so it seeps into your cells. And if you have this adenovirus 8036, your, your cells actually absorb glucose a little bit more right with this. And they also create fat molecules a little bit easier and ultimately more fat cells. So it's almost like having extra insulin where your cells are absorbing a lot of glucose and getting a little bit fatter, right? Um, except that you don't even know what's happening. You just start gaining weight. And, and again, you know, I always say this, through all the things I talk about, the ways that people are fat challenged, none of this means you have to be fat. It just means you have to work harder. Mm -hmm. So Randy, you know, after figuring this out and finally having some, some light shed on him, he runs every day, right? He watches his calories. He's six foot one, I think. He eats about 1200 calories a day. He says that I am not part of the eating world. There's the eating world and the not eating world, right? He, he, when people are eating pizza, he'll have his boiled eggs and salad, right? He's mm -hmm. very diligent about it, but he's really thin too, right? So he did conquer the problem. And again, knowledge is power. You just have to know what it is that, you, that your body's dealing with. 
That's a super interesting story. I wonder if there's different treatments too to eradicate the adenovirus or a vaccine of sorts or something. I mean, maybe if it was more prevalent or tested. Um, I used to always, I have a bunch of like Google alerts set up when new, you know, peer reviewed articles are published and infect obesity was one of them. And it was this interesting kind of convergence of infections creating uh, overweightness and obesity. And anyway, I, so I, I really resonated with that. There's different, you know, in the military, I read they, they used to to give erythromycin to troops to fatten them up and stuff. So, you know, there's residual antibiotics in our food now and our water supply and this and uh, yeah. And if you look at the central part of the country in the Southeast, where there's a lot of agriculture going on, it sort of makes sense as correlation. Um, do you see NIH research dollars being allocated towards that? Is that a, a research interest or is this just something that might be randomly published in obscure smaller labs? Yes, I, I think, I know there's some people doing some research on it and there, there might be a vaccine. I, I think the issue with it is that it's not that deadly. So you start you gain weight with AD36. But if you think about NIH dollars and how they have to spread the budget, they're really going after deadly diseases, right? Cancer, right? Certainly COVID, things like that. Um, you know, Alzheimer's, which is affecting so many people. So now if there's a virus and there's a grant or a, a research proposal, say, for I want to, there's this, you know, virus causing fat, people are gaining 30 pounds. It's kind of on the low part of that totem pole, yeah. right? You know, like, well, I have all these deadly things I have to try to find solutions for. So I, I, I think it could, you know, be a vaccine eventually. I think you need more proof, more correlative, correlative studies showing that it actually is causing this obesity. So it has to have a clear mechanism of action. You have to see it in mass. And there's been a lot of studies done in the army so that there have been some mass studies. And again, the, the problem probably has to be deadly enough that it gets really big funding. I mean, obesity research has gotten more funding just in the last 30 years because it's become an ep epidemic. And so a lot more research dollars have gone into understanding obesity, which is how we know the things that we know now. These scientists got funding for their projects and we're learning things. So, I mean, it could be in the end, but, but the issue is also going to be it's not going to prevent fat. So even if you knock off 8036 with the vaccine, there's plenty of other ways to get fat. And so right. this is always the problem with obesity trials because there's always a drug treatment for obesity or, or, or something like that. But people really do have a hard time keeping weight off. Even if you fix one thing, there's plenty of other ways to get fat. Yeah, no, that's a really, really good point. Um, and one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is liposuction. Uh, there's a few studies out there that have shown that, you know, it, it was popular in mean, the late 90s. I remember a few different actresses and things like that did that. And, and I remember hearing about it. Now, I haven't heard much about it since, but there is some articles that talk about, well, okay, so if you get liposuction around the abdomen, you, you sort of redistribute that. And does that, it seems like the, the fat organ, you mentioned it's an endocrine organ. It, it's smart enough to know like, hey, I see what you're doing. You're trying to like spot reduce fat. We're just going to put it over here. What, what, what's your perspective on that? It's so interesting and so defeating, right? So it, it's similar to losing weight when you diet. So when you lose fat, you lose leptin right? So your body goes crazy because it's almost like an inventory of calories that your body is keeping with leptin. Depending on how much you have, it has a sense of how much energy it has in the body. And so when you remove some, it's like something's happened. We've just lost fat. Something's wrong in the environment. They're not getting enough food. And so it drives you to eat more. Your metabolism is lower. And what happens though is, is as you start to gain weight back, it redistributes differently. And I don't know that there's a really good reason for this. So I know that the research, I actually write about this in the book as well. People have had some liposuction in their thighs, say, um, and slowly they, they regain weight and it goes to their visceral fat instead. So it goes to a much less healthy place. Um, some people had liposuction and the fat redistributed to their arms. So the fat is coming back and it's coming back in a, a different place. Maybe because your body sees that the place it was taken from is now damaged or had some mm. trauma. So it's going to put it somewhere else, but you can keep it off after liposuction, but you have to do what people do after they diet. You now have to eat less and exercise more to keep that fat off. And so liposuction is not a total solution mm. because your fat, your body's now kind of just like from dieting and, and re leptin reduction, it's kind of geared to need fewer calories now and want more exercise. So you're not burning as many calories as before. So you, and if you have to eat less and exercise more, you might as well do that from the beginning and not get liposuction, right? Lose your fat through exercise and diet without the liposuction. Yeah. I mean, gosh, that would be because it would go in kind of unphysiologic places or something like that. So which you couldn't have any control over. And that would be really scary. It's, it seems like when you start to really mess with nature in that way, there's unintended harm and consequences that you didn't foresee that are unfixable or untreatable or whatever. Um, gosh, there's so many different things we could talk about, Sylvia. Uh, is there any, I want to 
kind of get into, you know, so it's about 6.30, almost 7, your time, uh, intermittent fasting. I want to get into maybe what you're going to do tonight if you've had dinner or not. But anything about fat in particular, um, obviously, you know, you have a great book out there, and I'll put links in the show notes. Anything that we didn't talk about that's kind of exciting to you that you feel like people should know? Definitely. I'm looking more into the psychology of fat and the psychology of controlling your life. I, I think that's a big part of it. I think you have to be in the right mindset um, and you're ready to lose weight. It is not an easy thing to do. And this is probably what's different about me compared to all other diets. You know, people out there, they always say, oh, it's easy. You just follow my diet and you lose all this weight. And that's not easy, right? It, it, especially if you have stubborn fat and you've had it for a while, you're in for the long haul. And you have to be mentally prepared to take on that journey. So there, there's times in your life where you can and you're ready. There's times where you probably shouldn't start it because it's just going to be defeating. And so I'm, I'm kind of into the mind over fat, um, you know, thing now of how do we build that? I mean, you alluded to before that sometimes when we cheat, we get a little bit more empowered and we're ready to, to get back on more. And there's actually research around that. So when I write about some of it and I talk about it in my course as well. So there, there's one research where people had to hold on to a hand gripper for a long time. And then um, people who took a break and got a chance to watch a really fun movie they came back to the, to the experiment and they were able to hold that hand gripper for a long time again. People who went off and watched a sad movie, they couldn't do it. They could only hold it for a little bit, right? And, and there's research like that where you have to replenish your happiness um, again. And sometimes actually going off your diet and just like getting a little normal, feeling like you're happy again, it helps you go in for the long haul. You can have willpower fatigue. And you see this in hospitals with doctors washing their hands towards the end of the day, they just don't feel like washing their hands anymore, right? And so really you need shorter shifts or you need larger breaks in, be, in between or during the shift by which people can recharge, do something fun that makes them happy and get back at it. So I, I think what, what makes people want to start changing their lives, that's really fascinating to me. And then there's some interesting work by uh, the uh, National Weight Control Registry because they study dieters and successful dieters and what is it that made them start um, losing weight? and usually it's a shock. Like they either had a diagnosis or they saw a picture of themselves and they were heavier than they thought, but there's, there's almost some shock that galvanizes them to take this seriously. And then their habits afterward, they don't come off their diet almost ever, or very little. Um, they exercise every day, but they start to catalog like all the behaviors of people who are successful at life change. So I think that's what's really fascinating me. And, uh, and also in the course, I do a whole section around building out your willpower, making it more successful for you. So that it doesn't feel like work, right? It doesn't, it just becomes a habit. And that's how I got good at intermittent fasting. If I, if I go off around Christmas, which I always do, um, it's hard to get back, right? Because I broke the habit and it takes me like a month to get back on this. But once I'm on it, um, I'm on it. I don't even think about eating dinner. And so, you know, when, when you ask, what am I doing tonight? Nothing, I'm not eating. I'll tell you that. Good for you. Um, you know, probably what I will do is, as I also like to do a, a high intensity interval training when I'm fasted, which seems crazy because it seems like torture and it is a little bit, but that's another way I've learned when I plateau, it really busts through, right? If I get to a plateau again in my weight and I, I do intermittent fasting strictly and I, I exercise at night with HIT, it starts to come off almost like half a pound a day, which for me is, is a lot. Usually I can barely lose any weight, mm. but, but it works. And so that's kind of my night. That's what I'll be doing. But again, it's habit. I've made it a habit to where it's not torturous. I have my ways to get through it. You know, another mental trick I talk about is temptation bundling. So if you have to do something that's hard to get through, like working out for me, find something that makes it really pleasurable and just indulge. I know that there's an actual experiment I write about where they had people listen to a really juicy audio novel while they worked out and people mm. who didn't. And the people who got to have this temptation, you know, while they worked out, they worked out a lot, a lot more. And when they took away the audio novel, they still worked out more because it had become a habit. Right. And so like I watch a movie or I, I'll rock out or something during my exercise because it's the pleasantry that goes along with that, that bit of pain that I go through every night. Gosh, that's such a good tip right there. I mean, uh, there's this newer book, Good Habits, Bad Habits, and the author kind of goes into all of that uh, about how these are our subconscious habits. Um, you know, we know we shouldn't be having the cookies. We know we shouldn't binge watch Netflix. We know we shouldn't have three glasses of wine, but we do. Why do it? It's out of habit. And so, um, she really gets into it, it, kind of what you're saying, which I think is, is so fascinating. So it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's one thing to, like, we've been talking left brain, you know, logic and all this, this whole time, but appealing to that sort of that right brain, uh, you know, you know, and subconscious really to, to, um, you know, create new habits, I think is, is awesome. And, 
um, it feels uncomfortable at first and all that, but you know, one of the things that, that she likes to offer, and it goes back to exactly what you're saying is, is a reward if you continue with it, but have some, don't have it be too predictable. Like maybe it's three gummy bears for you, you know, but then the next night, maybe it's half a glass of wine or whatever. So it's, it's sort of this infrequent so that, you know, you can reward yourself. And I think reverse dieting and maybe cheat days or things like that sort of help with, with these sort of things. And yeah, I mean, it's just super fascinating, but the, the, the notion that we're going to willpower our way through weight loss, I think is not really feasible, right? Because your willpower is subject to all the stresses that life had. How bad was the traffic? Are your kids yelling at you? Like willpower is a finite resource and it, it's, it's hard to kind of, you know, out willpower, you know, cookies and ice cream and all that all the time. Yes, and that's also why people are fatter now than before. Life's really frustrating, especially with COVID, right? The COVID-15, it was frustrating, depressing. People were home all the time. So I think you need willpower at the start to get the, get the diet and your habits going. And then hopefully they turn into habits where it's not needing willpower as much. Yeah. And there's a lot of research around that. Like if we can reduce the amounts of decisions we make every day, we, get, we, we don't get decision fatigue where it's, you just do it. And so, and so once you do it, you know, I always say like, like success begets success and loss begets loss. So as you get better and better at it, it gets easier to be better and you just keep getting better. Whereas if you go down the slope of like, you know, Christmas time or the holidays, you still going down the junk and the cookies, it's easy and easier to go down the slippery slope. But the key thing too, and this is an important point is um, you have to not give into the slippery slope. So there's something called dichotomous thinking when people um, come off their diet which is if I didn't have a perfect day, I failed, right? I'm a loser. I might as well binge now, right? And it's, it, it shows up in a lot of places, this dichotomous thinking. Some students have it. If I didn't get an A, I failed. People who do that, they're really, they're subject to eating disorders, depression, all kinds of things. And it's more in women than it is in men, right? So when you do go off your diet, everybody will. The real key to successful dieters also is that they can get back on their diet the next day, right? So they can have ice cream, there was a birthday, they get back on the next day. There's not self-flagellation and guilt and I'm not a good person. So you have to be forgiving to yourself when you go on a diet, right? And, and perfect isn't really the goal, uh, the goal really. It's just to get healthier, keep that in mind too, because I think some of the impossible goals and the glistening six pack abs that are on diet books, it's almost unachievable. And I think it turns off people. And when they find, well, I've only lost 10 pounds, I don't have those abs, they feel like they didn't win. And so you can't let the perfect get in the way of the possible, right? Understand your own fat blueprint. Um, understand that you might have a harder time with it. It might take you longer and you might not be perfect. You might not have six pack abs. What is important is you have a, a healthy level of fat. It's in the right places and you're metabolically healthy. Keep that in mind, right? Don't let the perfect get in the way of the possible. Mm, I love that. There's a lot of great terms here. Um, the nutrition latitude, I think. Was, was it food latitude or nutrition latitude? That's a brilliant way to... Talk about that because that, that I talk about that all the time. You know, when it comes to fasting, I use something different, but you have more flexibility. And I think uh, that's great. Yeah, there, there are, uh, I have noticed that uh, in doing coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, women do sort of internalize things more and, and feel like I am broken I, and use words. I have a sluggish metabolism, all of that, and then start to actually then believe it. And then it's like, well, we're trying to not only change your habits and all that, but your thinking as well, because you know, what you are, uh, you know, a manifestation of your thoughts. And so that's just another thing. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's so much of it, I, I think is biomedical and all of that, but then there's also the psycho spiritual mindset component that, that is, that is not really talked about enough, right? We, we tend to really get into the minutia of controlling, you know, energy and food and all that. Yeah, no, I think you're like the 20th coach that has told me that. I think it's now like <laughs> through all that meta-analysis, it is certain that women have this problem more than men. Men will have a beer and say, yeah, I had a beer. And they just get back on the treadmill. They don't, they're self-forgiving. And it's very interesting. But but I think there is there's something to be had around researching more just the mindset of people who can change their lives. I mean, even drug addicts, right? There's, there's people who can get back, you know, they go into rehab and they stay off. They're good. They have changed their lives. And those are the ones that have recidivism and they're always back. But there, there's something around being, what is the mindset around changing your life, right? Figuring that out. And I think a lot of times it's a shock or a loss, right? That, that really sets you in place of, I want to seriously make a change. So it's almost hypnotic, right? When you finally have that one event, I think at that moment where you're so motivated, you use all the willpower in your body and then you build habits and make it be a habit. So willpower is not needed anymore, right? You don't make that, you're not fatiguing your willpower. It's just a habit. And then try to come off in limited ways and get right back on. And then I think so brilliant. he'd be okay. I love <laughs> no, that. We all come off, but you know, you can get back on. 
That's great. And make it automatic. So will so that you don't even need to use willpower. It's like, oh, it's seven o'clock time for my hit workout. Like when I get up in the morning, I, I used to have coffee right away. Then I sometimes would meditate, sometimes wouldn't. Now it's like, okay, I check my glucose, heart rate variability, cold shower, then coffee. If I don't do those things, I cannot have coffee and I love coffee. So um, now it's just like a habit. Like if I go stay somewhere, I'm like, what am like, I need, I need my, my, my routine. So um, yeah, I guess in, in closing, I uh, create you know, healthful routines because these habits can go the other way, right? If you go home and you normally hit, hit the refrigerator or hit the cupboards and all that, then that becomes a bad habit. So, uh, Sylvia, really, really appreciate you coming on here. So you have this great book, the secret life of fat. You have a course, you know, if people are driving or walking their dog right now. Um, what's the best online resource where they can connect with you? So you can reach me on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram on at Sylvia Tara PhD, right? One cool. word. Um, the book is on Amazon. It's at Barnes and Noble. And you can also, there's a website, thesecretlifeoffat.com. And you'll see the book and the course and some other materials I put up on there too. Um, I write some materials and then put it there too. So I mean, there's a lot to know. I'm all about the science behind what we do. And so I think for that deep research, I like to share whenever I get it. I love it. Thank you as always for coming on and have a good hit workout later tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much.